The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! Hello and welcome into Views from the Sidelines. I'm Joey Tyson, my partner Malik Hill, and uh, we're one week away. One week away from the NFL draft. NBA playoffs are in full swing, and there's a bit of a, a couple little tidbits of news around the NFL. Um, the big one being Jalen Hurts just got paid big time. Understatement. Yeah. He's the, he got the biggest bag. The biggest bag that you could imagine that anybody's ever gotten, um, two hundred what two hundred fifty five million, yes, uh, which is crazy. Uh, we thought Deshaun Watson's contract was crazy at two fifty, um, with all the weird guarantees and stuff. But um, I'm glad to see that Jalen Hurts has surpassed him. It's cool to see because I've been a Jalen Hurts fan since he came into the league, and even back when he played in college, I thought that he was always kind of under the radar for people. Uh, it looks like he's the the future for Philadelphia, which is, I mean, it's a good thing. They made it all the way to the Super Bowl and came up just a little bit short. And he was not the reason why they lost. Right. He played his butt off. Yeah. Uh, do you think this does anything for Lamar Jackson? I know we keep bringing uh, Lamar Jackson I think up. it does absolutely nothing for Lamar Jackson. Yeah. Which just puts more pressure on the Ravens, mm -hmm. in my opinion, because once again, if you don't want Lamar, then what are you doing? Right. Are you going to throw Tyler Huntley out there and just make the fans try to be happy? Yeah. Because that, that's, not, that's not what's going to happen. Are we just wasting people's time? Yes. Like, what are we doing? Yeah, it still doesn't make sense. Um Anything else you wanted to add about the Jalen Hurts contract? What do you think about it? I mean, just his his story from Alabama to now is really just something special. The fact that he got benched in the national championship, wasn't the starter the next year at Alabama, still stayed, goes to Oklahoma his last year, balls out. Most people wasn't weren't sure if he could be a even like Decent NFL quarterback. Right. The Eagles take him on a flyer in the second round because they trusted his talent. And within two years, Carson Wentz is gone. Within three years, he's in the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. I mean, just just how much better he got every year that we've seen him play quarterback. Yeah. And they believe it's insane. The, the cool thing, I guess, too, is they believed him in him enough to go out and get weapons. Yeah. Like we saw them get AJ Brown. They drafted Devontae Smith. Both of and those. this was after them missing on yeah. Justin Jefferson mm -hmm. just a few years before. Yes. Jalen Rager. Listen, J.J. Arthago Whiteside. There's tough to, tough times for the Eagles then, yeah. but they've turned it around in a major way. Yep. They finally did it. Their defense is really good as well. Um, so I assume they're going to be a face in the NFC for a while, which is cool. Um. We are going to get to some NFL draft talk today, um, but we're going to go through the NBA playoffs first uh, since next week is basically all NFL draft. Uh, so with the NBA playoffs starting, it's been a mixed bag. There's been some really good games, some really good series, and some not so great games. Uh, it just kind of depends, which, I mean, that's normal in the first round. You can get some weird matchups and things that just don't happen. So, I want to start out with the boring matchups first. Boston and Atlanta. We saw them last night. Uh, the Hawks played better last night. They held held decently well for a while. Uh, but in game one, Boston just blew the brakes off Atlanta. They looked like they didn't know what they were doing. And they're just... 
I don't know. They they look like they're in trouble. DeJounte Murray has played pretty well in the series. Trey Young's been kind of iffy. And for a team that I thought was a lot deeper, has seemingly struggled at times with their depth. Yeah. Uh kind of all over the place. It's and, even it's even harder when John Collins, the guy that's supposed to be on paper your second best guy. Yeah. He went two of eleven, one of seven from three yesterday. Yeah. And that's been a thing that Quinn Snyder's been trying to get John Collins to shoot more, which showed up pretty well at the end of the uh, regular season. But he has definitely struggled in the series so far. And even like DeAndre Hunter stepped up a lot early in the game yesterday. But down the stretch, got really inefficient, started struggling. Yeah, hit him and hot stretches of Bogdan Bogdanovich. Mm -hmm. His shooting has kept them in some of these games. Yeah. And... For them to hang in that game last night, DeJounte Murray had to hit seven threes, I think it was. Yeah. <laughs> Some, he might do that like twice, two or three times a season. Yeah. Um, but he showed up in that game. The weird thing for me that I was talking about kind of before we started was Trey Young just seemed like he didn't seem like he was in attack mode. I mean, he still finished with 24 points, uh, did decently well. And I know Marcus Smart is usually guarding him. Um, they put the better defensive assignments on him at times. But at the same time, like he's supposed to be the best player on the team. And he's kind of like, I don't know if I want to say shying away, but he's just not being as aggressive as I think he needs to be, I guess. It seems like he's finding, I don't know if it's finding a hard time getting good shots. Mm-hmm. It seems like he's settling Yeah, way too much. Mm-hmm. Like his floater in the, like, in the paint is close to automatic. Yeah. I've seen him take it maybe like four or five times in the past four or five games. Mm-hmm. He should be taking that like as much as possible. Yeah. Even though he's small and doesn't have bounce, mm-hmm. he he's figured out how to get to the free throw line a lot. He hasn't gotten there a bunch. Yeah. And the threes, just uh, his shooting touch just isn't there right now. Mm-hmm. But he just keeps chucking up threes. Yeah. It's it is tough. Mm-hmm. And like we said, there's just not not really anybody stepping up. On the Boston side, Jalen Brown had 29 in the first game. Jason Tatum had 29 last night. Shouts out to Derek White. <laughs> not his hairline, though. Well, it's, we're not going <laughs> to get to that. Charles Barkley said, called him Stephen A. Smith. That's hilarious, but disrespectful. 24 the first game, 26 and 7 the second game. When they traded for him, this is what they thought they were getting. Yeah. A guy that came from San Antonio, played – a lot in playoff scenarios besides, De- um, I mean, alongside DeMar DeRozan. Mm-hmm. A guy that was ready for these types of moments. Yes. And he has just been everything they need Yeah, and it, in it, terms of consistency. The biggest thing is it takes pressure off of Marcus Smart on offense. Yeah. He can focus more on his defense. And so, I mean, if, in the first two games, Boston just looks like they're ready to go back to the NBA Finals. So, for me, it's been the most boring series so far um one that's another one that's boring that could get worse uh tonight I don't know what the news is at Miami and Milwaukee now it's not like without good reason obviously but Miami beat down on Milwaukee in game one and Giannis went down very early in the game had like a back injury tailbone injury bruise whatever um He tried to come back for, like, I don't know, less than a minute, and then he immediately went back to the locker room, missed the rest of the game. And it's terrible for Milwaukee. Now, they are one of the deepest teams, and they've been there before. They have the players to step up. And I wouldn't say luckily, but (laughs) I'm going to say luckily. Miami also has their own injury. Tyler Hero was diving for a ball, broke multiple like fingers, I guess, or yeah. wrist and stuff. So he's going to be out until if they were to make the finals, basically, by some chance. Um, so both teams have pretty serious injuries, but I think Giannis is probably the more important guy just because he's plays both sides of the ball better. And I don't know. It, it, it makes the... <sighs> It like makes the series boring, but it makes it interesting at the same time, I guess. 
because now an eight seed has a chance. Um, what was your takeaway from game one on this series? It was a weird game, really. Mm -hmm. I, it seemed closer than it was, but Miami just was able to like keep a clo like a really respectable distance, mm -hmm. and then they just went a went away with it in the fourth quarter. Jimmy Butler, even though he took twenty seven shots, he was fifteen of twenty seven. Yeah, he was efficient, which is efficient. Thirty five points, eleven assists. Mm -hmm. That's the performances you expect from Jimmy Butler in the playoffs. Yeah, Kevin Love hitting four threes off the bench was huge. Yeah, eighteen and eight from him. And then Bam Adebayo, another slow start, but ended up with 22-9. and 22-9-7. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 10 of 18 shooting. They overall, they shot the lights out, mm. really. Like, gave Vincent four or five from three. Tyler Hero, two threes. Max Struess, two threes. Caleb Martin, two three. Everybody hit shots when they got their opportunities. Right. And you needed a game like that to get one over on Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And you probably need to keep shooting like that to win over Milwaukee. Yeah. Because they're a good defensive team. Mm-hmm. And that is the hard part. Like, they did win by 13, but Milwaukee only shot 24% from the three. Yeah, that's why it, it was a strange one. So, like, there's definitely room for Milwaukee to just shoot better and be fine even without Giannis because Giannis only played 11 minutes. Only Seeing Chris Middleton get 33 is promising. Yeah. Because he hasn't been himself since he came back from injury. So, mm -hmm. that's good seeing him play like that. Yeah. Um. So... Not much to say on that one. They will play again tonight. And then the other one is Denver in Minnesota. Denver just This is one we can just won easily. You know, I was kind of like I don't know. I guess I was fooled into thinking that Minnesota was better than they were cuz they they looked pretty good in the play-in games. Um so I was like, okay, maybe maybe Minnesota has like a chance against Denver to to steal one somewhere. Uh I didn't see that in game one. So I, I'm still, I guess, hopeful, but man, like Anthony Edwards was your leading scorer with 18, and he only shot six of 15. Cat was five of 15, one of seven from three. He only finished with 11 points. And yeah, it was, it was just bad all around. Listen, I, I'm going to go with the phrase that Chris Broussard has said about the Minnesota Timberwolves they are silly and unserious. Yeah. Like they you watch them play and you just don't you don't see a winning team. Mm -hmm. You don't see a winning culture when you watch them. Yeah. They have a bunch of talented players, even some good veterans. Yeah. Like Mike Conley and Rudy Gobert. Mm -hmm. But when it comes down to it, what are what are we what are you getting out of yeah. the Timberwolves? Yeah, it's unfortunate. Yeah. Uh the cool thing for the Nuggets though. The Nuggets just look like a good basketball team. Yeah. yeah. And the thing that I like to see for them was Jamal Murray it looked like he got his confidence back. And looked like he was he was starting to feel himself. It looked like he played a lot of min minutes, even when they were way up. I think because of some of his injuries and things, just to try to get him comfortable. And by the end of the game, he did end up looking pretty darn comfortable. The other thing that I forgot about Denver is they also have Ish Smith. So they have four former Pistons on their team, and Ish Smith only played four minutes. Yeah, and Reggie Jackson only played four minutes. Love to see it. <laughs> Love to see it. Well, disrespectful. K KCP had a good game, so that's cool to see. But yeah, uh, those teams will play again tonight, and yeah, I I've lost all faith in Minnesota just just from that one game. So has Minnesota. I'm yeah, pretty sure, most likely. Yeah. Um. Then we'll talk about the Lakers and the Grizzlies. Lakers took game one, one twenty eight to one twelve. Not what I wanted to see. Bless you. Thank you. Is this just a Austin Reeves podcast now? Oh, is that what man. this is? Is Hillbilly Kobe like the? He's good. He's that good. that was more than good. I know. But there there know, are players that are getting paid a lot of money mm -hmm. to play like that in the playoffs. Well, and he's just here. People are saying he's going to be paid a lot of money. He probably is. You know the nice thing though. I'm pretty sure both of us were on him during the draft. Listen, we he had some games in that tournament. And throughout that season at Oklahoma, also we knew he had game, mm -hmm. but this right here, yeah, fourteen good. in the fourth, mm -hmm. just going crazy, like yeah, I, yeah, I I can't say enough about Austin Reeves and what he did in that game, mm -hmm. and then Rui Hachimura, yeah, five threes, twenty nine, twenty nine put. They needed these performances from them two to win, yeah, because honestly, LeBron was cool, yeah, it was like a 
okay LeBron game. Mm -hmm. Anthony Davis was good, but they weren't. They didn't do anything special. Yeah, I guess it was, it was just normal games from them too. Mm -hmm. And Memphis was still playing well throughout. Right. Yeah, Rui and Austin they put the they put the Lakers on their backs. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. But I do agree Nothing with but respect for me. <laughs> I do agree with Austin Reeves, Desmond Bain. I don't think. Rui Hachimura is going to do that again. True. So some people are saying that's disrespectful, and yeah, that just shows what the Memphis. It's a, it's true. Right. Rui doesn't do this. Yeah. So if he does it, chalk it up to him. Congrats. Yeah. You got to do it again. The thing I would say too is like to to counteract that statement as well is that the Lakers got no production from Malik Beasley, who's a guy that can. He's get either 15. horrible or really good. Like there's no in between with him. Right. Right. Now. So you could take away. 15 from Rui, put it on to Malik Beasley, and it'd feel like that could have been the way they won as well. Um, yeah, Memphis, man, Jaron Jackson has played really good. He's been phenomenal. Down the end of the season. Like, shocking, even though we know he has a lot of talent, yeah. he's been shockingly good, mm -hmm. like, on the offensive end. Right. Um, other than that, like, Memphis was a little inefficient. They didn't really get anything from their bench. Um Luke Kennard didn't do as well as he has been lately. Uh, John Morant also kind of didn't do anything special. Like the stars just didn't yeah. didn't get involved in this game, which was weird. Yeah, he he was like on and off attacking throughout the game, and then he had an injury that could – yeah, still don't know if he's playing tonight, which could be a big one. Right. But I just want to say, forget all the stuff Dylan Brooks does off the court. I'm tired of him getting the Kobe treatment on the basketball court and the Memphis coaching staff just allowing him to, to do whatever just, he wants. Yeah. Why do they keep giving him this? I, I don't, I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> Dylan Brooks is, he does, he shouldn't be getting these shots. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I need an explanation. I agree. He's, he shot five of 13, two of nine from three. Now I know nobody else was really doing, doing anything, but, like, Luke Kennard's a way better three-point shooter yes. than Dylan Brooks like, is. Dylan Brooks is not a scrub. Yeah. But he has become more mouth than game. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. Yeah. Like, you need you need to give him a set role mm -hmm. that isn't taking whatever shot you want when you want to. Is it? There has to be something specific. It yeah. has to. And I think this is the hard part about Memphis is like, if they're not clicking, I think their depth is just not, it's just not necessarily there as, as far as like somebody that can just score like outside of jaw Desmond Bain. And now I guess now Jaron Jackson has kind of stepped into there, but if like, and usually, like I said, you want to have three guys, but if they need somebody else, I, I don't know. Do I want Dylan Brooks yeah, being them, them missing Brandon Clark is huge, too. Because yeah. he was a guy that hit open threes, crashed the boards, catch lobs. Mm -hmm. He was a big energy guy that was like a key piece for them off the bench. Right. Brandon Clark. Yeah. So, it's interesting. We'll we'll have to see what happens again tonight. Um, the next series that I want to talk about. The Sixers and the Nets. Sixers are up 2-0. First game... James Harden had a crazy good game. He hit seven threes, uh, looked really good. And then game two, James Harden was terrible. But but, but yes, Tyrese Maxey was incredible. Yeah, he hit six threes, uh, had thirty three points. Um, Joel Embiid, I mean, he's been getting double teamed every time he catches the ball. He finished with twenty and nineteen. Tobias Harris. Is he like one of the most overlooked players in the NBA? No, Joey. D don't fall for this. <laughs> no, why are you doing this? <laughs> he doesn't play for the Pistons anymore, and he got his contract, and we know what he is. Yeah, He has these games mm -hmm. like every two weeks. <laughs> yeah. And then he gets back to his regular like 13 or 14, sometimes less than 10 points. Mm -hmm. we, we know what Tobias Harris does. He always th – this is why I say he he's like the most – he should be the happiest man in the league. Yeah. Because he has these games, and he has people say stuff that you just said. You know, is Tobias Harris overlooked? No. 
<laughs> we do this every other year with Tobias Harris. Yeah. And then you look at his money and you look at his normal stats and you go, oh, yeah. He's That's just fair. Tobias Harris. That's fair. You know who else we know exactly who they are? Who? P.J. Tucker. Listen, King Cardio himself. <laughs> 0 for 5. 0 for 4 from the 3. <laughs> Zero points. Eight rebounds. This is good for Listen, he got those rebounds at least. Three assists. He didn't even have but a steal. P.J. Or... Tucker looks like somebody's dad out there playing basketball. He looks like he should be in a men's league. Uh, That's what be, he should be, pretty much. Get him to a YMCA next year. Yeah. I, I mean, I hate dogging on P.J. Tucker because... I like dogging on P.J. Tucker. I do too, but like at the same time, like I respect his. He shoe. did a lot for Milwaukee. I respect and he the shoe well game in Miami for the most part. So it's just weird. Um, back to the actual game though. Uh, Brooklyn has played pretty good. They're just. I feel bad for Mikael Bridges and Cam Johnson. Yeah, it's like they they are doing every bit of heavy lifting they can do, mm-hmm. but they're they're only so much them too. Yeah. Like Mikael Bridges, we we're starting to see. Mm-hmm. He's probably an all-star caliber guy. Yeah. And Cam Johnson keeps getting better. Yeah. But outside of that, what do you trust? Could you tell Especially Chris, on offense. Could you tell Chris that again? Cam Johnson's getting better. I, oh, yeah, I'll tell him. Because he hated Cam difference. Johnson in the draft. And Listen, I liked Cam Johnson. His age was the reason. We we both knew Cam Johnson was a step in and be able to hit shots guy. Anyway. Um What happened to Joe Harris? I don't know. That's it's like was, that's the weird thing, like they don't use him. They need more shooting, in my opinion. Spencer Dinwiddie has struggled mightily in both games. Uh, Are they just not going to play Cam Thomas? They're letting Royce O'Neal shoot nine threes. He took eleven shots. <laughs> is Cam Thomas hurt? Dorian Finney-Smith is also taking six threes. Is Cam Thomas hurt? I don't think so. It looks like he's on the not played list. Play him in Yuta Watanabe. They have shooters on the team. That's like like we said. The Joe, only one I trust is Seth Curry. Joe Harris. And Cam Johnson. Joe Harris, Seth Curry. I haven't seen Joe 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 Harris have a really good shooting game in like two years. So I can't trust him. Um his last good shooting game was like three games ago. How good was it? Uh where am I at? Oh wait, no, it was wait. Ah, who cares? It was four games. Look ago. at what he did against Boston oh, in the playoffs is. last year. He was a ghost. <laughs> you know why I remember it? Why? Because it was against the Pistons. <laughs> he had six threes. Oh, cool. <laughs> Good job, Joe. Nice. Okay. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Anyway. The, the Sixers are dominating for the most part. I don't know what's going on with Brooklyn. Like, I feel like they should have been able to play better. In my opinion, I think they should give up on the double teaming of Joel Embiid. You might as well. Cause, Just yeah. let him get his. I agree. Guard everybody else. I agree. That's that's how I feel. It's weird. I hope Brooklyn steals one or gets one a win at home or something, but it's not looking good at the moment. Um, which one do we want to talk about next? Let's talk about the Kings and the Warriors. Since I mean it's a good series, but um it is still two oh. So Sacramento up two zero on the defending champions. The last time the Warriors were down 0-2 was in 2007. That's wild. And the Kings are fun to watch. Now, I think I've said it multiple times. I think the Warriors have a chance to repeat. Uh, I think they're good enough. But I would not be disappointed if the Kings win. Because they're a fun team. They play hard. I've never seen... Somebody play such good defense on Steph Curry like Davion Mitchell did at at times. Obviously, he gets beat uh, after a while because he's Steph. It's yeah. it's Steph, <laughs> so like you can't. But there's there was times where you could see Steph was visibly frustrated, um, which is cool. And now the big controversy is Draymond Green. He's suspended for Game Three for stepping on Demonis Sabonis. I'll let you go. For it. What's, what's your take on it? Listen, he he kicked Stephen Adams in the private parts. He's he's done things like this before. Mm-hmm. Now, is it strange that as he's gotten older and he should be wiser and more mature, 
but he's still doing young Draymond stuff. Yeah. I think that's kind of stupid. Mm-hmm. It's unnecessary. But this is what you get when you get Draymond. Yeah. The whole package is it's the mouth. It's the when I'm not I'm not that good on offense, so I have to do other things to impact the game. Even if he gets kicked out, he does those things too. Mm-hmm. And so you, it's just the whole package of Draymond, which is very annoying at times. But when you have him and you're winning, it makes all the difference. Right now they're losing. Right. So, yeah, it's it's not doing much for them right now. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, not having him for that first home game in Golden State will not be easy. Right. Now, maybe the bright side is that they can play more patented small ball Golden State basketball where you might see Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Andrew Wiggins, Kevon Looney, and I don't know. They've been liking Gary Payton lately, but I would think it'd be Jordan Poole, uh, but you never know. I'll be interested to see what their lineup looks like. Um, I would bring Jordan Poole off as a six man. Yeah. just Start to. GP. Okay. Um, the wild thing is though, as much as the Warriors have kind of struggled in the series, Andrew Wiggins has kind of started, he like he started last night's game pretty well and struggled a little bit towards the end. Um, but like the Warriors, they lost by three in game one and then they lost by eight in game two. So like they were still right in it. And the Kings are basically like, I don't know if you heard the interview with Mike Brown in the middle of the game. But he said, we're just going to keep letting it fly. And they did. They shot 9 of 38 from 3. Um, so if if that's going to keep happening, like the Warriors are going to be able to take advantage of that. Um, I think the Warriors' defense just needs to step up a little bit. But, man, I have to give credit to the, uh, the Kentucky boys. De'Aaron Fox and Malik Monk, they have played really well. <clears throat> and De'Aaron Fox, man... He's just closed out fourth quarters all season long. And I haven't, obviously, because he's plays for Sacramento, I haven't really watched, but he plays so good down the stretch. Yeah. And he just he, goes he won attack. the first ever Clutch Player of the Year award, mm-hmm. which uh, I don't really care about. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know who does, but good for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would like him to take less threes, probably, uh, just because it seems like he's better attacking. But that's their philosophy, philosophy for their team. I mean, they're letting Davion Mitchell take six threes, so Mike Brown is definitely letting them fly. Well, I, I, coming out of college, the three-point shot was kind of like one of his pluses, mm-hmm. so I can understand letting him take six. Yeah. But, yeah, De'Aaron Fox taking ten threes, that's a lot. Mm-hmm. It's its a bit much. And the only thing I would say that's maybe a positive for the Kings and that they could keep winning is that, like, their other guys – like Harrison Barnes, I think still has room to play a little better, and obviously my guy Kevin Herter definitely could play better. He's, he's just struggling from three. That's kind of his biggest biggest thing at the moment. But he's been pretty good at attacking, to be honest. Um, and Sabonis has just been Demontis Sabonis playing hard, playing physical. It's been fun to watch. His efficiency on offense is beautiful to watch. Mm-hmm. Twenty four points on on eight of twelve shooting. Yep. Like, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's not much better than that. Got to the free throw line 12 times, knocks down eight. That's the other thing. They Like, they hit free throws. They were pretty good at free throws. And uh, the Warriors did not get to the line very much. So They, they don't score in the paint, and they don't defend. Yeah. Which Two is, major problems. Which is weird because, like, they have guys now that are back, Andrew Wiggins, Gary Payton. He's one of the them to defend, but outside of them, right? who are you depending on? But like, even like Clay Thompson, you're not seeing get as many good yeah. he, defensive he, players. He can't defend the same way he used to. Yeah. I think that's pretty clear since his injuries. Yep. But uh, now the Warriors are at home, so we'll get to see what happens. And uh, hopefully it's more fireworks. Um, do you want to talk about the East or the West tied up? Let's New York. The, let's stay in. Actually, yeah. Let's go to the east. Okay. Let's go to the east. So we got New York Knicks and Cleveland. New York took Game One, which was kind of a surprise. I mean, I think that New York is good, but for them to take one Game One in Cleveland through Donovan Mitchell's heroics, basically, um, was pretty impressive. 
Julius Randle had a decent game. Jalen Brunson had a good game. Uh, nobody else really did anything. Josh Hart, I guess. He stepped up pretty big. And then, uh, yeah, Donovan Mitchell had 38, which was crazy. Um, but Cleveland only lost by four. And then in game two uh, last night, the Cavs took advantage and kind of beat up on the Knicks, 107-90. to 90. Um, This time, getting production from Darius Garland, he hit, what, six threes. And uh, Donovan Mitchell didn't have to do much. He was a, a facilitator for that game. And we saw the X factor of Karis LeVert really uh, help the Cavs. Uh, what did you see from this game? Uh, the Knicks looked like a team that lacks top-level talent and a team that still kind of – they look like one of those Tom Thibodeau teams that run out of gas at the end of the season. Mm-hmm. We saw that happen several times in Chicago. Yeah. After the Derrick Rose injury. The Julius Randle shot choice is just strange at times. He doesn't attack the basket enough. Jalen Brunson is like their only real shot creator. Mm-hmm. And he shot terribly in this yeah, game. Yeah, that's a problem. RJ Barrett needs to be benched. I think his time in this series, it's, it's just not happening. His game hasn't developed. He has no dribble moves, which is really disturbing. He has yeah. no go-to dribble moves. Darius Garland guarded him, and he couldn't get past him. Mm-hmm. Like, he has to do a fadeaway jumper that just bricked. Yeah. It was it was just ugly. And, yeah, quickly, they're not getting a, a, a ton out of quickly. He played great near the end of the season. Mm-hmm. And Obi Toppin hasn't been really good either. So, right. yeah, they're, they're a young team. Mm-hmm. Even though Julius Randle is in his late 20s now, they're still very young, and they're still figuring things out. Yeah. So a game like this honestly shouldn't be that surprising because Cle- Cleveland has the talent advantage, and I, I just I like the way they play more. Mm-hmm. Like the, the Knicks finished the season on a high note, but the way Cleveland is constructed and they're two big men with Donovan Mitchell and Gar, I just like them much more the way they're constructed and how they play. Yeah. Um, it will be interesting to see what happens when they now go to Madison Square Garden because obviously that's a huge home court advantage. We don't see the Knicks in the playoffs all too often, so their fans should be ready. Um, but also, like, I'm curious to see because Donovan Mitchell is known for, like, playing well in big situations. So that should be a fun matchup. I'm just hoping – the Knicks can shoot a little bit better, so it's more entertaining of a yeah. game. <clears throat> I, I want to go completely on the villain side, the Trey Young side. I hope Donovan Mitchell drops like 45 in the garden. <laughs> I I want it, I want the crowd to be silent or just screaming crazy stuff at him in the fourth mm-hmm. because he's just destroying them. To me, that's what <laughs> – it's kind of sad, but that's like the best part of watching games in Madison Square Garden. When an opposing player comes in – and just destroys and just takes the crowd over completely. Yeah. And makes them silent. Mm-hmm. That says a lot about the Knicks franchise, but it is what it is. Right. I want to see the Cavs get, I don't know about back to back wins, but just like one. Yeah. A really good performance from Donovan Mitchell. Right. Split again. All right. And then the last series that we have that ended last night uh, Phoenix and the Clippers. Suns are tied up the series one to one with the Clippers. Clippers took game one and uh, basically behind Kawhi Leonard. And then Phoenix last night, basically on the wings of Devin Booker, um, won their game. Well, kind of your guy, Torrey Craig, too. Torrey Craig is my guy? Uh, when did that happen? <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a memory of that. I think you've talked about Torrey Craig as just not being anything. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's probably why. Being a cone. Yeah. Um, but what did, what have you seen from the series so far? Well, I can't disrespect Torrey Craig in this series because he <laughs> hasn't been the problem. He's actually played well. Mm-hmm. He had 22 the first game and 17 this in game two. So yeah, yeah good for Torrey Craig. But yeah, game one, I think it showed that the Suns are still working on their chemistry and figuring out who they are as a team and a starting five specifically. 
they I'm trying to pinpoint yeah they they're just inconsistent with this lineup like DeAndre Ayton you can get like 18 and 10 from him or you can get like 14 and 6 you don't know yeah Chris Paul he can be really good Chris Paul or bad Chris Paul at this point Devin Booker and KD are figuring out like how to divvy off their shots and how to play together. Right. And their bench is strange. Yeah. Their bench is very strange. Mm-hmm. Like campaign isn't playing. You got Josh Okogi, Ish Wainwright, Jock Landale, who I actually like, mm-hmm. and Landry Shamit, who isn't giving them a ton right now. So. Bismack Biombo. Hey. Good old Bismack. That one run in Toronto still has him in the league. Mm-hmm. So good for him. But, yeah, it's, Phoenix is still figuring things out. That first game, Kawhi Leonard looked like he's back. Yeah. He's healthy and playing just like the claw. Russell Westbrook went 3 of 19 but still had a great game. Mm-hmm. Played really good defense and rebounded great. Uh, My guy, my real guy, Eric Gordon. For the past two years, I've been begging Houston to get him out of there. <laughs> they finally get him in a winning situation, and he's producing. Yep, I'm happy to see that from him. Yeah, they they just they they took advantage of a team that was still in flux yeah. with KD back in that first game. Mm-hmm. Game two, things were different. One twenty three to one oh nine. Devin Booker had thirty eight. KD had twenty five. Chris Paul had sixteen yeah. on efficient shooting. Uh, Tory Craig five threes. That's not going to happen often. Right. Kind of like Rui Hachimura, but even worse. Mm-hmm. So good, good, good job from Tory Craig. Only 13 points from the bench, still not great. But right. when your starters are firing on those cylinders, mm-hmm. yeah. Plus, looking. when you look at the Clippers, like Kawhi had 31. Russell Westbrook had 28. He had a really good game. He's had a good series so far. Um, but they don't have that third guy. Like Eric Gordon kind of struggled in that game, and he's not going to be Nick like, Batum gave them 0 for 4 yeah. in 19 minutes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think he's kind of stealing money at this point. But Zubak lost a lot of minutes. I don't know what from, uh, but they're playing some small ball. And then, like, just nobody else really did anything. Uh, they're not getting good efficiency out of Norman Powell, um, things like that. I expect him to bounce back. Yeah. I think Bones Highland has kind of been weird for them off the bench. Like, to me, his confidence has gone up and down. And to me, it's still weird that they don't play, like, the veteran guys like Rocco and. Marcus Morris, I know, struggled towards the end of the season. But even at times, like, I don't know. Like, those guys. Playing Nick Batum that much and not playing Robert Covington is. Yeah, like. Ty Lue is a really good coach, borderline great. Mm -hmm. But that's not very smart, in my opinion. But what do I know? (laughs) It just seems weird. I don't know. I'm not sure either. Um, And then the other thing, too, is, like, the Suns did really good passing the ball. They had 30 assists as a team. Um. And comparing that to 17 from the Clippers, like Devin Booker had nine assists himself. Chris Paul had eight. Durant had five. So like your star players are not only getting your most points, but they're also passing the ball um, a lot, which means they're they're looking for yeah. open shots. There were a few possessions where they almost overpassed, but mm-hmm. it still led to points. Like they're they're trying their hardest to like really yeah. share the wealth. Right. Yeah. So that could be huge for them. They might have they might have found their footing. Um, in this series with that game last night. Um, so, yeah, those are all the series updates at the moment. And tonight, tonight we have Lakers, Grizzlies, Heat Bucks, T-Wolves, Nuggets. Um, do you think any of these series get evened up tonight? So, out of these games, I'd say, man, if Ja doesn't play, Jaws doubtful. I hope he plays. They and they need him for this one. Mm-hmm. I don't expect Rui Hachimura to do, do that again. Him and Austin Reeves should hover around like fifteen points. Mm-hmm. That's like their normal thing. Will AD or LeBron dominate in Memphis? I'm not sure. I'm gonna go Memphis game two. Okay. Yeah, I think you get a a pretty good balance game from Memphis, and. I don't think LeBron or AD really dominate. I think they have good games again, and Memphis takes advantage of it and has a close win. Okay. 
Game two, Heat Bucks. I'm going to go Bucks. I trust Jimmy Butler, but I don't know if K-Love can, like, continue to have these really good games. I don't know if he can. Mm-hmm. Tyler Hero being out will hurt. Right. So, yeah, I'll go Bucks game two, and then that, that last game isn't even a question. Yeah, I figured. Yeah. Unless Anthony Edwards or Cat go off, they don't have a chance. Yeah. But they didn't look like they were going to um, in game one. Okay. So that's the NBA playoff update. We'll give a little bit more next week uh, before we get into the NFL draft mock. But um, most likely there will be a couple series that are over um, already by next week. And uh, we'll talk about it. So getting into today, we wanted to talk about some of our favorite prospects and some of our uh, NFL draft sleepers if we have time. Uh, But the first thing that I wanted to bring up because it was pretty – interesting news last week is that um <clears throat> the lions brought in cj stroud for an interview now you only get so many interviews pre-draft um you're limited to i can't remember if it's like 30 or something like that um but that was an interesting one because it seems almost impossible for cj stroud to fall to six so does that mean that the Lions are thinking about moving up? Are they serious thinking about getting a guy of CJ Stroud's caliber, like possibly the second best prospect in the whole draft? Um, Where do you see this for the Lions? Like, do you like it? Do you not like it? Do you think they're wasted in an interview or do you think it was worth it? I think it's kind of a waste of an interview. Okay. In my opinion, I don't know how controversial this is. I think C.J. Stroud is a younger, more athletic Jared Goff. Maybe that's why they interviewed him. <laughs> Detroit fans would because, like that. Because he reminds them so much of Jared Goff, maybe. He is a guy that uh, clear, clearly he's more athletic. He can get out and make passes when he needs to. Mm-hmm. But his his strength and what he does that will make him millions for years is sit in that pocket and hit accurate passes on time, short, intermediate, and deep. Yeah, He's going to stand in the pocket and hit and make throws and make very impressive, accurate throws. And Jared Goff can do that. That's what he was coming out of Cal. When he started to get going with Sean McVay as his head coach in L.A., that's what he was known for doing, just hitting accurate passes to talented receivers, mm-hmm. and that's what he's doing in Detroit. That's what he did last year. He was extremely efficient. I like a top five most efficient quarterback in the league. Yeah. It was one of the big reasons why they ended up winning nine games. So I guess I, I'll change it then. It wasn't a complete waste if they see him as a better version of Jared Goff. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you know what? No, I'm going to swing all the way around. <laughs> I'm going to do a complete 180 and say that that was a worthwhile yeah, meeting. Talk seeing yourself into yeah, it. Yeah, seeing where his head is at, seeing if the comp is what well, I'm kind of like, I, I don't know if the Lions see that as like a one-to-one mm-hmm. comparison, but it make it makes perfect sense to me as, as like they're typical, similar types of players. Mm-hmm. But yeah, seeing where his head's at and seeing if you're confident in what he can be because I think we both agree he's the safe option at quarterback in this draft. Yeah. You know what he's going to come in and do if you have the proper uh, weapons and, like, the blocking around him. Mm-hmm. You know what he's going to give you. So, yeah, I wouldn't say it's a waste. Yeah. Now, I do I think they should trade up and draft him? I don't know. I'd still go defense, mm-hmm. preferably Will Anderson. But if they did it, I mean, you're probably getting same to even better production from him in a year or two as right. you're getting from Jared Goff. Yeah. So the scenario that I've seen a lot is that the Lions trade up to three because everybody knows the Cardinals seem like they would be the most willing to trade out. So the Lions trade up to three. Carolina takes Bryce Young. And Houston, who has said that they love Will Anderson from the get-go, decide they're not going to get a quarterback just yet. They're going to go Will Anderson now the Lions, who at three thought they could get Will Anderson, are now stuck, sort of. And for them to move up and basically take the same guy they could have got at six seems like a waste. 
So now they have, you know, they've already interviewed CJ Stroud. They see that he fits, then they're okay with that. So then it's it's less risk for them to move up. I think that's more of what they were doing is that to decide if they want to move up because there is that chance they move up. Will Anderson isn't there, and now they have to take C.J. Stroud. Would they be okay with that? That's kind of my thinking, um, or I would hope that that's what they're thinking as well. Um, I wouldn't hate it, but I also would be disappointed if they traded up and then ended up with C.J. Stroud or something. Um, but I, I like, again, I like when Brad Holmes is trying to get aggressive. So I wouldn't be opposed to it. I guess I would have to, to trust the process at that point. But um, it is very interesting that they're they're taking a look at quarterbacks, which I don't think is a problem. But uh, it's interesting. And in one week, we'll figure out why. Um, okay, so let's do. Let's start with some of your favorites. What's uh like one of your big favorites? Whether it be for anybody or the Lions, you can, however you want to spin it. So I. Uh- my big favorite in this draft is Zay Flowers. Okay. Wide receiver from Boston College. I think almost everybody is starting to get on board that he's probably the real best receiver in this draft, mm-hmm. if not Jackson Smith and Jigba, because all you have to do is turn on his tape, turn on his highlights. His cutting ability and his stop and start are beyond elite. Mm-hmm. Like, there's some people are starting to say, like, Antonio Brown is his correct com- comparison. Because route running or when he has the ball in his hands, getting hands on him is like it's it's not not impossible, but it's extremely difficult to do because he's so fast and quick and has such a high level ability to move and cut. Yeah, he has great hands, high level route runner for his size, like five nine, one eighty something. He can go up and get it. I think he's everything you want in a receiver in today's game. Mm-hmm. Now, is it nice to have receivers with size? Yes. You can you can also find that in the draft later. Right. But I, I think Zay Flowers, he is, I think, on the low end. Uh, I forget his name every time I try to bring him up here, the receiver from Seattle. 16. Oh, Tyler Lockett? Yeah. I think on the low end, he's Tyler Lockett. And I think on the high end, he could be Antonio Brown, which is a franchise superstar. Mm-hmm. He has that level of ability and athleticism. Now, we'll see if he can put it all together, but yeah, Zay Flowers, he's he's the truth. Uh, sorry, I was looking at something. No, tell us why Jaden Reed is your favorite. No, just no he's not. Who's your, who's your main like, favorite? I do like Jaden Reed. Uh, so I'll start with one that's like more of a, just a generic, and it's like, it's super obvious, but Bijan Robinson. I'm a huge running back guy. I like running backs. In an um, era where running backs are devalued. Yes, yeah. I know. That's the big problem. Nobody wants to take a running back. Blah, blah, blah. This guy's worth it. Whatever. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, they're saying he's the best prospect since Saquon Barkley. How did Saquon Barkley pan out besides a few injuries? Outside of the injuries, he's been pretty good. His production is good. So if you can tell me that Bijan Robinson is supposed to be possibly better, and, I mean, you can't. Uh, you can't predict injuries necessarily um, with certain guys who can, but like the talent is there. And I think, I think a running back can still change a team in the league today. I know people don't value it as highly nowadays, obviously, but if you get a guy like this, it can definitely change the whole dynamic of your team. And that's why I said, even if, like, I would be disappointed if the Lions took Bijan Robinson if he fell, but also at the same time would be excited too because I know what he could do behind this offensive line. So you, if you put him in the right scenario, or like a lot of people are projecting the Eagles to take him, like that is just a smash hit. And especially for the Eagles who have, you know, a number 10 pick that literally could help a team that just made it to the Super Bowl is wild. Um so, B. John Robinson is probably my number one guy that I'm excited to see where he goes. Yeah, I, I'm i very afraid the Cowboys are going to trade up and get him. And I'm even more afraid because I think he has the level of ability to have like a Zeke Elliott type rookie year. Yeah. Where he was instantly like all pro and a top three running back. Mm-hmm. Bijan is that good. Right. So, 
the next guy I'm going to go with is a guy I talked about last week. We were talking about defensive players. I think this guy could be like a potential, like when Leighton Vander Esch was like fully healthy and just all over the field making plays and being a terror. I think that's what Jack Campbell is from Iowa. Okay. He's 6'5", 250. Mm-hmm. Excellent size. He moves better than that size. He can improve in pass coverage. He has the athleticism to do it. He's great in the run game, yep. run stopping, and he can pass rush if you need him to. I think he's a hard worker that is just going to keep getting better. And as long as he stays healthy, I think he can be a pro bowler several times over mm-hmm. as a linebacker. He's like everything you need in uh, middle or outside to me. He's he's what you want in a linebacker in today's game. Even with the rules being weird and dudes getting kicked out for helmet to helmet when it's barely helmet to helmet. Mm-hmm. He's a physical, physical, extremely high IQ linebacker. That should be able to play for a long time in the league. I'm a big Jack Campbell fan. Uh, the next one I'm going to go for is another one that I've uh, talked about quite often. It's more of a Lions specific guy, um, but if if the Lions get to, I don't know the the fifth fifth round is kind of like where I think of it. If the Lions get to the fifth round, Dorian Thompson Robinson is on the board, and they don't take him, I will be so disappointed. Agree. <laughs> um, I just love. The upside that he has with the lower draft capital that it takes. You know, guys are talking about Anthony Richardson, Hendon Hooker, stuff like that, where they have to move up a lot. And maybe Dorian Thompson Robinson kind of gets that way sneakily towards uh, next Thursday, but I just really like it for a guy that could sit behind Jared Goff for two years realistically um, and then come in with a lot of experience and just take over. Because he has a lot of the same upsides that those other guys have. He's athletic. He can throw the ball well. And like that is the biggest problem with Jared Goff is he cannot get out of the pocket if he needs to. Um, Dorian Thompson-Robinson can. He can do a little bit of running. And again, with a guy like Ben Johnson on his offensive coordinator, I feel like it, he could just shake things up with DTR. So that's the one that I like for the Lions specifically. I'm going to follow your quarterback up with another quarterback. A guy that I have enjoyed watching the past few years. A guy that probably won't be a long-term starter. But a guy that I think could be like Gardner Minshew. Or maybe even better. Maybe he could be like a Purdy situation. Jake Hayner from Fresno State. I think he's a winner. Mm -hmm. I think he's a high-level high IQ quarterback that can throw it deep, short, intermediate. He's accurate at all three levels. Mm -hmm. He's only like six foot 200 and he's had injuries and he can't really run around and make plays, (laughs) but neither can Gardner Minshew. He has the same type of height, same type of build. Mm -hmm. He can move around a little, but he's not scrambling and making crazy plays. He's mostly going to stand there and just make throws. Yeah. And I there's always room for guys in the league that can do that. Mm-hmm. I think he is a guy that in several systems on several teams will probably be a backup for a very long time and will come in and go on win streaks for teams multiple times. Mm-hmm. I like Jake Hayner a lot. So, yeah, figured I'd just give him a spotlight. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll give one more defensive guy. And then I'll give you the last, the last pick. Okay. Um. Let's see. Who did I want to go for? Yeah, let's just go with more chalk. Um, I just really like Lucas Van Ness's motor. Um, I, I mean, and to be honest, like just the Iowa guys in general, uh, like we said, Jack Campbell, stuff like that. Like, I just like the way that they play. They play with speed. Um. They seem like they get off the line quickly and they just disrupt things immediately. Um, And it's just fun to watch. Uh, Obviously, like, I'll take Will Anderson or Tyree Wilson as well, but where Lucas Van Ness can shine, like, he, like, 
where he could be at in the draft could he could be at one of those spots where he could potentially be on a playoff team. Um, and I always think those guys are the most interesting when you get to the, to the point of the draft where there's really good value to where a team could, that you could go to could turn into a playoff team very quickly um, is always super interesting to me. So my last player, a safety. Okay. And he actually has a college teammate that's ranked higher than him mm-hmm. in terms of safety rankings. I'm going Sidney Brown from Illinois. Illinois has just been churning out like corners and safeties the past two years. Like they're like secondary, secondary you at this yeah, point. They're, they're on a roll. And Jartavius Martin is ranked ahead of Sidney Brown on mm-hmm. the rankings right now. Yep. But I feel like Sidney Brown is like a complete safety, Yeah. in my opinion. Like he's really good in coverage. He can come up and lay the wood. He's very physical in the run game. I just, I I don't see many flaws in what's in now. He doesn't have a ton of speed. He's only 5'10". Mm-hmm. He's not huge. He is like 210 pounds, so he has some size. Right. But in this, at the safety position, I think he gives you almost everything you need. And there are a few slight injury concerns. He did miss some games at Illinois, but it is what it is. I mean – when he's on the field, he is high impact. Yeah, in both pass coverage and the run game. So yeah, I think Sidney Brown is going to be a starter in the league for a long time. Yeah, he's uh been mocked to the Lions a couple times, so could be one that's on the radar. But yeah, Illinois has tons of secondary guys. Um, should be interesting. Okay, that's uh, basically all the time that we have today. Like I said, next week the big mock draft, and. Uh, yeah, gonna have some new wrinkles. The big Thursday. Some exciting things. Yeah. Coming for the the next mock draft. Yep. We're gonna decide who gets first pick and who gets evens, who gets odds. But we think we're gonna throw in some trades. I think we're gonna get exciting. Yes, sir. Um so we'll see what happens. Um and then we'll talk about some NBA draft or draft playoff stuff. Uh see who gets knocked out already. And then uh, we'll basically hope and pray for Thursday next week that the Lions do well. <laughs> um, but other than that, this has been Views from the Sidelines. We'll see you guys next time. So if I start this draft off by just completely throwing caution to the wind and trading the first pick after acquiring the first pick. It's been rumored. Are you ready? Are you? Carolina, I'm messing up the franchise. <laughs>